Hello, and welcome to the Canola Discovery Forum, day two of Canola Week. My name is Warren Ward, and I am an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada. On behalf of the canola industry, we would like to acknowledge the passing of Phil Thomas earlier this year. If you did not know Phil, he was one of the giants in the canola industry, and in particular, had a large impact on canola agronomy. For us at the Canola Council, Phil's work on building the first canola growers manual, which eventually evolved into the online canola encyclopedia, has been an immense benefit for the canola industry. Every one of us who are listening has benefited from Phil's work. Thank you, Phil. The Canola Discovery Forum is an interactive annual meeting held by the Canola Council, where we share our current extension messaging, dig into research priorities, and look at some of the current research, both ongoing and completed. There will be a session in the morning, followed by a break, and then an afternoon session. During the break, I encourage you to visit the networking lounge, which can be found by its link in the main conference lobby. This will be a great way to interact with both speakers and conference attendees. Today is a mix of both pre-recorded and live presentations. For both formats, we encourage your participation. Questions can be asked by using the Q&A box on your screen. During the question period, our moderators will then read the questions and the appropriate presenters will provide answers. I would also like to thank our sponsors who are listed in the main lobby. Now let's get started with an informative and interactive day. Our first presenter of the day is Justine Cronelson of the Canola Council of Canada. Justine will be presenting on 2020 yield robbers and 2021 key messages. If you have questions for Justine, please type them in the Q&A box on your screen and they will be addressed during the next live question and answer session. Hi, I'm Justine Cronelson agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada. And today, on behalf of our crop production and innovation team at Council, I'm going to present some of the yield limiting factors from the 2020 growing season and introduce some of our top extension messages as we move forward into the 2021 season. So before I dive into yield robbers for the season, it's always great to have a base foundation of where we currently are at. So these numbers have been pulled from a stats can survey of principal field crops, uh, which happened at the end of August. Uh, so these are just estimates that for the time being, and there will be some updated numbers coming out in early December. Just a few items to note, uh, right? We were sitting around uh, that uh, 20.8 million acres and with a rough estimate of producing almost 19.4 uh, million metric tons of canola. Uh, canola for a field crop has had the highest farm cash receipts for well over a decade. Hence the popularity here in, in Western Canada. Uh, when we yield over a 20 year period, which it's hard to believe 20 years ago was, uh, was to the 2000s, um, but you can, you can see where canola was averaging around that 26.5 uh, bushels an, an acre. And so we're now looking here the last five years at, a, at this plateau. Um, and so this year, the, the rough estimate was uh, 41.6 bushels an acre. Um, right, so we're, we're kind of flatlined here a little bit and, and really what's holding us back from hitting our yield goal of 52 bushels by the year 2025. Um, so, you know, that's what we're going to just have a, cre a quick uh, look at this uh, season and then see what was holding us back. Obviously, in, in 2020, we had some really severe environmental conditions, right? There was areas that were too hot um, or either they were too dry uh, or some regions that remained underwater for a good portion of the season. Uh, we also dealt, dealt with some really aggressive winds, both within the spring and the fall, contributing to poor stands and, and, and pod drop. Uh, for our pests, for the most part, uh, they were relatively quiet. Uh, flea beetles are, are always there and they're causing uh, damage and, and losses in pockets. Um, and as for canola uh, diseases, um, you know, they remain to, uh, to be very dependent on our environmental conditions. Uh, one disease to note this year that, 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 that did really well in the hot, dry conditions in Manitoba uh, was verticillium stripe. So when we look at, at the environmental stressors, heat being one of the, the big players, uh, we saw some really extreme heat over the flowering period. Um, so this has been identified as, as an area for losses in canola. Um, this particular graph pulled from a Canada um, is looking at the number of days with a temperature above 30 degrees from the beginning of April to the beginning of August. So right covering over that flowering period. 
Uh, we saw some pockets in, in the southern prairies show well over 15 days with temperatures above 30 degrees. One, uh, one item that's not really well captured um, are the overnight lows. Uh, that, that nighttime low uh, really has more of an impact than that daytime temperature as that nighttime period is seen as a recovery time for plants. Uh, full recovery from the heat during the day occurs when the nighttime lows drop well below 16 degrees. Um, so, so this allows that kind of crop to compensate. So with some really high overnight lows that we were seeing this summer paired with just heat during the day and, and lack of moisture, this is what's all causing additional stress to the plant. Uh, parts of the prairies either had, had, had uh, really good moisture or not enough or too much at the wrong time. Uh, right, so parts of the prairies uh, started off the season with, with really good soil moisture and then soil temperatures in the spring, um, where you know our, our plants then are able to uh, really uh, don't have to root down as much. Uh, right, so with that adequate soil moisture to get the uh, crop going, uh, that really minimizes the rooting depth required for the plants. So when June come around and the tops were completely turned off, uh, these plants were then stressed out and they had to put energy towards root growth to assess or access some of that uh, soil moisture reserves, uh, which was taking then away energy that would, would have gone towards seed growth. And so this map here is just looking at the percent of average precipitation across uh, across the prairies, uh, right? So you can see areas that were in the yellow that we're seeing of roughly 60% of normal. And then areas uh, like that Edmonton area that would have you know, decent rainfall all summer long or all season long, uh, we're up over um, in that range of 115 to 150% of normal. Uh, so in, in areas like that in Alberta, right, that we're leaving areas that were completely drowned out for the growing season. Uh, we had flash flood events occurring in Manitoba in June, where some regions received upwards of 10 inches of rain in a single event. Um, that being said, you know, there were other regions across the prairies that received the timely rains, and this is the first year in, the, in a few years that we've had actually a nice open fall uh, to get the crop off uh, dry. Extreme winds. Um, so the, the wind this spring felt like it never stopped blowing. Uh, we were experiencing these uh, Gartero windstorms uh, that were seen across the Midwest United States and the prairie regions of Canada. Um, and, and this graphic here produced by Manitoba Egg is just looking at really extreme events. Uh, so you can see that just for a random day in June, we had wind over 100 kilometers an hour in, in some of these pockets. Um, so what was happening then as we were seeing, uh, well, the province reported upwards of over 260,000 acres that were reseeded because of the movement of topsoil, the burying of seeds, and overall just really poor crop stands. Um, and, and this was not just uh, for canola, this was in all crops. Uh, wind damage meant to canola specifically caused entry wounds, uh, which could then allow pathogens um, in, 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 into already really stressed out plants. Uh, the fall was also subject to uh, some really gusty days that contributed to pod drop and pod shatter. Uh, it was tough to say, you know, how much yield was lost um, and the extent of damage. Uh, this particular image uh, is from Brockshire, an agronomist in northern Saskatchewan. Um, but you can see here, right, this uh, particular field had a uh, uniform pod drop, right, a blanket of pods uh, right along the soil surface. So it is tough to, to put a number to this, but uh, we were contributing some of our losses to the fall winds as well. Um, flea beetles, right? We've got to talk, if we're talking losses, we've got to talk flea beetles. Um, overall, they were, were quiet this year, but they were still causing damage and needed further management. Uh, historical yield reductions have been around that 10% mark. Um, this year, our, um, our uh, canola pest lead, Keith Galbert, completed a, just a quick survey of field agronomists to estimate the yield, uh, and this year the estimate was around 8%. Um, so the survey also indicated that there was 30% of fields that exceeded that action threshold, uh, and 31 fields actually received a fully insecticide treatment. Uh, so, right, so we do have these hot pockets in, in fields where um, several applications are, are needed to manage, uh, manage fields. Um, but overall, they were a, a little bit quieter than they have been in the past few years. Uh, tight rotations, right? We always highlight this as obviously a yield robber. Um, we, we've got lots of work um, that backs up the yield losses from, from going continuous canola or canola on a tight rotation. Uh, so from Neil Parker's long-term rotation study, right, he was able to conclude in, uh, to conclude how much yield was actually lost from growing uh, canola on tight rotations. 
So when you're growing a, a one and two rotation so canola every second year, uh, you're able to increase your, your uh, yield by over five bushels an acre versus a continuous canola rotation. And the same held true then when you diversified even further, when you were able to add another crop into rotation. So in Neil's work, it was a feed barley canola rotation that increased an additional five bushels an acre over that of the wheat canola rotation. So um, when you move and diversify to a, a three-year rotation from continuous canola, you're seeing 10 bushels an acre more, right? So we, we know the benefit um, to, to diversifying our rotations on a yield front. Uh, in the field, we don't necessarily always see that just with the increase in genetics and obviously the, the year to year uh, different environmental conditions, um, right? And our hybrids are getting stronger and different genetics being placed in the field. Uh, the risks. We are well aware of the risks to tight rotations. Things uh, like um, our, our stubble-borne diseases, like black legs, right, with that residue staying in the field uh, and not breaking down, it's introducing the pathogen into new fields. Uh, same with soil-borne diseases, right? So clover, you're building those clover spores. Uh, when you grow the, the uh, similar host plant, you are then uh, creating uh, all of these root rot pathogens within your soil as well that could potentially start um, causing damage uh, in these tight rotations. We also have to then look at things like our, our weeds and our herbicide resistance and then think about this green bridge that may be occurring right from, from volunteer plants, right? We're all just giving the host plants that these particular pathogens need um, or, or different uh, herbicide groups to then overcome. And the one really, really big thing is, you know, with high canola frequencies, we are putting pressure on our genetics within our hybrids. Um, and, you know, the loss of these tools are really, really difficult to quantify. So that was obviously a quick highlight of the yield robbers and, and what we were seeing in the uh, 2020 season. Um, a lot of them being environmental and we obviously recognize how difficult dealing with some of those environmental conditions are. Um, that being said, you know, our, our crop production and innovation team here at the Canola Council really wanted to focus in on this precision agronomy idea, right? Um, many of our top extension messages have not changed over the last few years, um, but we really want the industry to strengthen and become more precise in these topic areas. Um, so good agronomy um, is always coupled with economics and farm logistics, which is why we want to focus on becoming more precise with our best management practices and to follow up and ensure that we're actually meeting these, these targets and these goals that we're setting out for the farm. Um, so these key message topics, uh, topics have been kept in mind with this overall goal of increasing yields, profitability, and sustainability on farm while reducing the overall production risk. So I'm just going to go into each of these key areas, these top five. Uh, one of the, the first ones to kind of start off your season is, is picking a hybrid, a hybrid based on your own goals and priorities on farm, right? So you're going to write these types of priorities on, on your farm and to your field level. Uh, for an example, right, if, um, if you adopted or would like to go into straight combining, right, that harvest management trait with your hybrid is going to be probably a top priority for you on your farm. Uh, maybe even dealing with clubbert, right? Clubbert has been found on your farm, so now you've got to look at the, the clubbert resistant hybrids to make that decision. So that is going to then move to your top priority, right? The, the basics like the, the growing, uh, uh, your growing degrees, uh, the you know, length of maturity in your hybrid, the standability, the yield goals, right? Those all get coupled into there as well. So first step is, is right, identifying those priorities. Your, your second step, is right growing more than one hybrid on your farm all right when you do this you're able to compare hybrids across the farm and how they handle the different environmental conditions right so if you put all your eggs in one basket right you never know what else can happen or what else what else potential can happen in it within your hybrid so, right so we really want to encourage producers and agronomists to right to really diversify this on the farm and and get producers growing more than one hybrid a little side note, right? This is a secondary note to our key messages. Uh, but but last year, the, the canola industry at Canola Discovery Forum agreed upon using uh, clubbert resistant hybrids across all acres. Um, and as you can see here, right, there are lots of options available now, uh, right? There's, the, uh, there's the, the seed supply there now to help supply the industry with clubbert genetics. All right, we're still diving into what second generation means and, and really trying to understand the ins and outs of it. But this is something that we want or would encourage producers to try as a clubbert resistant hybrid to help minimize 
uh, that potential of building scores up within the field. Uh, so that's just something to note um, that it's great. We do have a lot of options this year. Okay, I guess the purpose of why we are here the next uh, few days, uh, right, is really diving into this new green stewardship idea, um, right? We are really encouraging uh, producers and agronomists to go this way. Um, putting a 4R nutrient management plan in place can help guide you and lead to more um, effective nutrient uh, or nutrient planning decisions um, that will ultimately help you achieve your yield targets while maximizing productivity. 4R uh, planning benefits um, growers both on an economic standpoint and environmental standpoint. Um, so we, we really want to encourage producers to work with designated 4R advisors um, so they can help, you know, get their acres uh, recognized through a 4R nutrient stewardship program. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to dive into a whole lot of detail here because you're going to hear a lot about this the next few days. Uh, but really the first step that we are really encouraging uh, towards that 4R nutrient plan is to get out and soil test. Soil test to determine your nutrient levels. Uh, that second piece is then establishing a yield goal. From there, you can determine the appropriate rates of nutrients to apply for each field to help reach those, those yield goals on farm. Uh, counterplants, <laughs> plain and simple, just get out there and do it. I can already hear my, my fellow, uh, fellow coworker, Keith Galbert, saying boots in the field. That is step number one. You've got to be out there in the field and you've got to be out there throwing the hoop and, and taking those types of measurements. Um, right, and, and why we're, we're out there counting plants is to help calculate that emergence number. Uh, when you're out there counting plants, you can see if you are hitting your targets, uh, which in the end will help you be helping to reach your yield targets. Um, when you go out and calculate emergence, this is going to help kind of determine all the rates for the future, right? What are you able to calculate? If, are, are you only getting 40% of your emergence? Um, from, from there, right, you can determine your survivability in your field, um, and that's going to change from year to year, right? If you're targeting a 60% survivability, but I actually in the field you're achieving maybe something like 80%, that is really going to change your seeding rates for the future years. Right? And, and this is something that obviously keeping really good records on is extremely important. Um, you are going to see changes from field to field, season to season, but with enough records, you can start to determine that average survivability on your farm, which will then, right, in the end, save you lots of money when you can actually know how many plants you are going to get up to hit your target plant stand. Uh, so one of the tools that Canola Council has is the Canola Calculator, uh, which you can go through and, and determine your seeding rate, your emergence, and your plant density. Uh, so right, first step, get out and count. You've got to be out there, boots in the field. Okay, now for my favorite part, uh, disease identification. So this is obviously where I focus a lot of my time and efforts in at the Canola Council. Um, it's, it's an area that I've, I've focused on heavily, and this year we had lots of questions. I'm not sure if it was just the, the 2020 season and we were spending a lot more time in our fields, trying to social distance ourselves, um, but we had lots of questions come up and, and you know, questions on what am I seeing? How do I manage this? What's my diagnostic lab report say? Uh, and really all comes back to the disease triangle, right? You, you've got to go through it, and yes, you might be able to isolate the pathogen in the field. So one example, um, I like to give is that, you know, in Manitoba, we know, and actually across the prairies, we know we've got clumbered spores all across um, Western Canada. Um, but not every field is showing these big, nasty galls that, that we, you know, always visualize when we see the clumber presentation. Right? So we've got to have then the environment there um, and the pathogen levels to then just get the actual disease forming. Uh, same goes for something like fusarium, right? We, we deal with fusarium species each year. You always get them back on a diagnostics report. Are they necessarily causing the disease symptoms in your field, right? So you've got to go through that and weigh out the options. You know, did you have the environmental conditions there to actually cause that pathogen to do well, to then cause damage to that host plant or host crop? So, you know, examples being canola. Uh, one other thing, right, we've just got the industry on board to being out there and scouting and, and raiding their black leg. Um, when we're doing cross sections through the root tissue, right, um, typically strong solid black is usually black leg, but you see other discoloration within that cross section as well. 
and, and not everything is, is, is necessarily black like we've got that discoloration, right? So uh, it, it's taking the advice of the trained individuals, you know, taking that lab report, backing it up with disease severity and incidence numbers, uh, bringing all of these little pieces together to then determine, you know, what is causing the damage in your field and then what can I do to manage it maybe in that crop season or maybe for, for future years if it's something like a hybrid selection or fungicide application, right? So that proper scouting and it just comes back to the, having the boots in the fields and then going through all of these steps. Uh, so just an example, right? So we see this, or we saw this like, um, a little bit here in Manitoba, right? With that really extreme cankering. Uh, this could be several different things, but uh, an indicator of seeing pachnidia would lead to being that of black lead. And here's our, our cross section. The, the image on the, the left hand side is actually verticillium stripe. So you can see that discoloration, a bit of a starburst, a grayish hue across that cross section tissue. If you leave that piece of um, stubble, it would end up developing microsclerosis, which would really help indicate that you're dealing with verticillium, verticillium stripe. Uh, the plant in the middle has got your uh, characteristic um, black leg features. Uh, so one of our, our last areas to really focus in on, on being precise with our agronomy is achieving less than 2% harvest losses. Um, and, and really to maintain that efficiency with optimum throughput and reduce losses, combine should be kept under that 2% loss level. Um, if you don't know what your losses are, uh, you're probably losing more than you think. So, right, it's not that difficult to get out there and measure. Uh, there's a lot of different um, tools out there. Uh, there's also the, the easy way of doing it, right, getting a pan and just throwing it out. Like, there's, there's ways of doing this um, that don't cost a lot of money, um, and they are really easy to do. Uh, last year, uh, uh, there was a PAMI project that showcased the losses, um, the losses that ranged anywhere from about 0.2 to 4.1 bushels per acre, uh, with the average losses being around 1.3 bushels um, an acre. And, and really what the PAMI project was looking at was that loss range, but they looked at a bunch of different brands, models, ages, none of those factors of the actual combine itself were significant. What was significant was the operator. It was the operator getting out and adjusting the combine settings and, and changing them to match up to the environmental conditions. That was the really key piece that helped minimize the overall losses. Uh, one tool that we've got here at the Canola Council is the combine optimization tool. So this has been a new tool that's been introduced to the Canola Calculator. Um, from there, you can go through and, and, and assess what your, your issues are that you're having during harvest. You know, was it grain loss? Was the grain sample quality issue? Productivity? You can go through this calculator to help determine some of your areas of, of field loss. Uh, so moving forward, so you know what, as, as we move out of this 2020 season to start planning for our 2021 field season, we, we know that environmental extremes and variability will still be there. Uh, you can't change the environment, um, but there are ways to help climate-proof your crop. So for canola, right, picking a hybrid that meets your priorities and addresses your, your largest pest uh, factors, uh, right, starting off the season with a uniform plant stand, applying the right rates, uh, the right levels of uh, nutrients to achieve your target yield, having boots in the field to identify pests and, and you know, determining where that yield is actually being lost from. Uh, and then lastly, ensuring that crop makes it actually out of the field and into the bin uh, by changing combine settings to the changing environmental conditions. Uh, you won't be able to obviously completely mitigate the yield loss from changing environmental conditions or these extremes, but you will be able to help minimize that crop impact through crop scouting, farm management, and precision agronomy. Being precise with our, our agronomic practices in the field will help the industry reach you know, our yield goals while maintaining economic in, and environmental sustainability. So thank you very much for your time today, and I will be available for any further questions. Hello, our next presenter of the day is Mackenzie Smith from Fertilizer Canada, who will be speaking on the Fertilizer Use Survey. If you have questions for Mackenzie, please use the question and answer box on your screen and they will be addressed during the next live question and answer session following Mackenzie's presentation. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the Four Nutrient Stewardship Program and our Fertilizer Use Survey. My name is Mackenzie Smith and I am the Director of Stewardship and Regulatory Affairs at Fertilizer Canada. Today's presentation will cover a general overview of foreign nutrient stewardship and introduce the framework to you, as well as an overview of our fertilizer use survey in Canada 
and specifically on canola production. Following the general overview, I will take a bit of time to uh, take a deeper dive into the survey and what all data the survey collects um, on an annual basis. And I will end the presentation by taking a bit of time to look at the canola results specifically and highlight some of the key findings from the 2019 results for your uh, review and consideration. So I'll start off by introducing the foreign nutrient stewardship concept. Uh, many of you are likely aware of what foreign nutrient stewardship is, um, but for um, the purposes of today's meeting, I'll review it um, by saying it's an innovative approach for fertilizer best management practices. And uh, this approach considers both the economic, social, and environmental dimensions of nutrient stewardship. And we feel it's essential um, to any sustainability of agricultural systems. Uh, the four R's is an approach to fertilizer management that helps reduce nutrient losses and grow an abundant and healthy crop by optimizing nutrients within your field. So the agricultural industry, uh, government and conservation authorities have committed to sustainable food production and for our nutrient stewardship provides us with a science-based framework for implementing, validating, and communicating those efforts as it relates to nutrient management. The concept is simple, apply the right source of nutrient at the right rate, the right time, and the right place. But the implementation is fairly knowledge intensive and can be site specific across Canada. In general, the right source means ensuring a balanced supply of essential plant nutrients, including granular fertilizers, liquid fertilizers, or organic manures. The right rate is applying just enough fertilizer to meet the crop needs while accounting for nutrients that are already in the soil and available there. The right times or it means applying fertilizer when the plant will get the most benefit and avoiding times when fertilizer could be lost to the environment, like right before a rainfall or on snow covered ground. The right place is where the plant can easily access nutrients. So uh, taking into consideration the root formation um, and where it would easily access the nutrients so they're not lost uh, to our air or water. So Fertilizer Canada as an association with our member companies continue to commit and prioritize increased adoption of foreign nutrient stewardship across Canada. And we've set the following target goals under our 2025 strategic plan for our stewardship um, pillar. Note that the second goal um, is measured through our annual fertilizer use survey, which highlights the importance of the survey as it relates to our industry and stakeholder partners like yourselves at the Canola Growers Association or Council. So in partnership with members and grower customers, Fertilizer Canada has committed to achieving 15 million acres, uh, validated acres under our four agronomy programming, whether it be for a designation in Western Canada or for our certification in Eastern Canada. And the second goal is to survey growers on an annual basis to assess knowledge and implementation of four best management practices, which supports grower associations and provincial government partners in achieving their sustainability targets. And we've aimed to achieve 30 million acres uh, through the fertilizer survey by 2025. The fertilizer survey assists in our understanding of the current state of fertilizer management in Can Canadian crop production and how growers use and make decisions about fertilizer applications. We've conducted the survey between 2014 and uh, 2020 now is our latest growing season uh, in cooperation and partnership with the Canadian Canola Growers Association and uh, Ontario Grower Association partners in Ontario, including the Green Farmers of Ontario, Christian Farmers, and Ontario Federation of Agriculture. The survey also captures baseline data about grain uh, and oil seed crops in Canada. And this information we believe is essential for developing sustainability metrics and uh, sound for our nutrient management strategies. We've found to date that the fertilizer use survey is demonstrating that Canadian growers are implementing for nutrient stewardship best management practices on their farms. And as uh, the nationwide adoption of for nutrient stewardship continues, these best practices are becoming the standard for sustainable management. 
So the survey in general aims to build a national database of fertilizer management practices, including source, rate, time, and place um, of fertilizer applications, also general fertilizer practices, and more widespread demographics. Uh, as of 2019, the survey has collected, uh, collectively captured data on fertilizer use from over 3,200 growers uh, in Canada who have completed the online survey and which uh, equals uh, a little bit more than 8 million acres of cropland. Uh, I will note here that the survey results I'll be presenting to you today are from the 2019 growing season. Uh, we collect data for the survey after harvest as we uh, collect actual yield information. So the 2020 data is currently being collected um, right now in November and December, and we'll have that um, data for us to review early in the next year of 2021. So as you can see here, uh, there's a fairly long list of metrics that the survey examines. It goes from uh, the general questions of source, rate, time, and place, um, which are kind of the first three or four questions on the screen. This uh, goes into more specific information that's collected on variable rates, incorporation, uh, stabilizer products or other enhanced efficiency products, and how uh, growers decide upon what rate they should apply to their crops. Uh, we also, as mentioned, collect uh, actual yield uh, data, so we can compare that to target yields and other practices. Uh, we do um, collect and uh, uh, categorize growers in high, medium, and low yielding uh, criteria or categories, sorry. And then we're able to cross-reference this with their practices, which I'll speak to a little bit further down in the slide deck. Uh, and then we also ask questions about micro or secondary nutrients, weather conditions, and tillage, other farm practices. Um, not shown on your screen, um, but for your information, we also collect um, farm size, um, the age of the grower, um, and other um, helpful demographic information for um, cross-reference information. So I have uh, broken it down here today uh, into one example for the sake of time. So here on your screen is an example of the results for nitrogen application. Um, and we've broken this down into the four R's, so time, place, rate, and source. Um, so if you look at the top left of your screen, you'll see the timing um, for nitrogen uh, by volume. And we see that um, on average, the majority of canola growers are applying their nitrogen at planting, as we see 70% of growers are doing this, um, which is considered a four hour practice. Um, if we're moving over to rate, which is at the top right of your screen, we can see that the average rate applied in 2019 was uh, between 100 and 149 pounds per acre. Uh, I'll note here that the four hour consistency for rate is evaluated by how a grower determines what their rate should be, not the actual rate, so such as soil sampling or other provincial guidelines or examples. Um, with placement, we can see that a very, uh, uh, a fairly high percentage or split percentage at the bottom left of your screen is um, uh, occurring in some form of banding. So whether that be in the fall or the spring, um, which are both considered to be consistent with for our best practices for placement. And last but not least, source. Um, we found in 2019 um, that the majority of uh, canola growers are using urea products for nitrogen on their farm. Uh, we, uh, of course, cross-reference uh, source and how it's applied to determine if it's consistent with for our practices, um, but we do collect specific source information as you can see here. So uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to review some of the four practices for canola and the findings um, for this crop within the 2019 uh, fertilizer use survey. So what are the four R's? We already talked about them at the, the top of the deck, but according to the results from our survey, 67% of growers uh, should already know what the four R's are as we see that they're um, familiar with this concept. Uh, so we, with a collective group of scientists and technical experts, have developed four consistency tables to actually determine also 
in addition to familiarity, um, how many growers are implementing um, best practices on their farm. So I'll move into that. So on the screen here at this time is an overview of the basic four requirements outlining how we determine if a grower within the survey meets our four uh, consistency criteria. So for source, we know that um, UAN should not be applied in the fall due to its nitrate content and any other product in the fall should be ammonia based. Um, any uh, nitrogen fertilizer applied in the spring or in season is accepted. For rate, moving to the next column on your screen, uh, we require that growers set crop and field specific nitrogen rates using appropriate regional tools. This can include uh, soil tests, nitrogen balance, response curves, or provincial guidelines. Uh, we also require that growers have considered field specific yield history or soil types. Uh, for time, which you can see on your screen as well, um, we require that nitrogen be applied on uh, cool soils in the fall or at spring before at seeding uh, and that no nitrogen is applied to frozen or snow covered ground. And last but not least for nitrogen, we have placement criteria, which uh, to be consistent with the four hours, a grower must apply uh, their nitrogen in subsurface bands uh, or broadcast in the spring. Uh, or if they are fall broadcasting, it must be with an enhanced efficiency product according to label instructions. Uh, no fall unprotected uh, application nitrogen is accepted. And uh, the second nutrient being phosphorus, we've also developed uh, consistency tables for this nutrient. And source, uh, the requirement here is that it must be a guaranteed analysis and known mode of action. Uh, more details in the following three, uh, the following three R's following source, we have rate, um, which to be considered for R, we require that growers soil sample at least every three years, um, follow guidelines and crop types, uh, set specific field rates and uh, adopt depletion strategies where uh, that is applicable. For timing, uh, growers must apply their phosphorus in spring or before seeding, or when applying in the fall, incorporate band or co-band with other nutrients. And finally, for right place, we require for a grower to be considered 4R, uh, that they place uh, their phosphorus with seed at safe rates, side band at seeding, or band or co-band prior to seeding, or mid-row band at seeding. So there's a number of options uh, within placement that could allow for a grower to be considered uh, for, our, for their phosphorus placement. So I wanted to tie back today's presentation to some of the goals that we have set along with our um, partners uh, being you, the Canadian uh, canola industry. So Fertilizer Canada and our member companies are very pleased to be supported by you um, through your recognition of the four nutrient stewardship framework and specifically through your support by setting a four R acre target goal for 2025. So as you likely know and have seen before, um, this goal is on your screen, which says that um, the Canadian Canola Council has uh, committed to utilizing four nutrient stewardship practices on 90% of their canola acres uh, by 2025. Um, and this is evaluated um, with the presented fertilizer use survey, which I've been going over um, today. Uh, in 2019, uh, we found that uh, just about uh, under 52% of Canadian canola growers met the four criteria, which um, is equivalent to approximately 10.8 million acres. Um, so as a reminder, um, this is in comparison to the 90% target by 2025 for canola, and it relates to Fertilizer Canada's uh, 30 million acres under the survey by 2025 as well. So although we have over half, per, half of canola, Canadian canola growers implementing practices at this time, uh, we do have some ground to cover over the next five years uh, to 2025. And I'll note uh, saying that, that uh, we have identified through the survey that the major gaps in adoption of four requirements 
for canola um, are rate determining criteria for nitrogen and phosphorus or uh, secondarily combining um, those with timing and placement uh, through the holistic approach of 4Rs. And so we ask here, why should growers follow the 4Rs? There's a few you know, slides on this that I think um, brings, hopefully brings the message home. Um, so what we've done with the survey is we've cross-referenced 4R practices to uh, economics or uh, actual yield data. So we found that the survey, um, through also asking growers for their actual average yield after harvest, we can use these averages and are able to place growers into three bucket categories from low to high yielding. And when looking at growers who follow the basic levels of 4R, there's a significant increase of 4R growers that are within the high yield categories versus the lower yielding categories. Uh, so this data shows that uh, through data that um, 4R practices can lead to higher yields, uh, which can help you attain um, higher um, uh, production, but as well as achieve your environmental and social um, goals as well as it relates to nutrient stewardship. And similarly, we took these categories and we compared them to who soil samples. So if we have low, moderate, and high yielding growers, what percentage of those growers uh, conducted a soil sample? Uh, to, so to ensure using the right rate of nitrogen or phosphorus, we know that growers can soil sample to determine what amount of each nutrient is needed. And in this uh, past year in 2019, we found again that higher yielder growers are more often uh, are more likely to soil sample than those uh, lower yielding. So a takeaway for today we feel is from the 2019 survey, this shows uh, that growers could increase their yields um, by more regularly soil sampling and following the basic levels um, of poor nutrient stewardship uh, as well in, in uh, parallel meeting uh, both our industry and the Canola uh, Association's goals of acres under poor nutrient stewardship. And I will say that Fertilizer Canada, along with the, the Canola Council and Association, is continuing to develop communication materials to outline the results of the survey uh, at a high level for both canola and also in Ontario, which we survey as well, um, to promote uh, the benefits of the program as it relates to both economic and, and environmental impacts. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention today. Uh, that was a very brief high level overview in 20 minutes of our survey results and the four R's as it pertains to our goals with the survey and the Canola uh, Association's goals. Um, there are, is a lot more information um, on our website of the survey. And if you'd like to review or have access to those results in full, or if you have any questions or comments for uh, Fertilizer Canada, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, via the um, information on your screen or, or to myself via email. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Mackenzie. This is Jay Wetter. I'm the moderate, moderator today. My mic's a bit hot. Uh, so to answer any questions uh, on Mackenzie's behalf, we have Kelsey Hill from uh, for our program. And Justine is back to answer any questions you might have about her presentation just before that. Anyway, so we do have one here for you, Justine. Um, is there a good correlation between plant stand counts and final seed yield? What is the acceptable stand counts and or percentage stand to achieve optimal yield? And there's a bit more there, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Have you got an answer for that one, Justine? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's something that we've uh, been focusing on the last few years. Uh, and the, the uh, target plant stand has uh, reduced over time. And we've, we are now recommending a five to eight plants per square foot. And that's uniformly across the field. Um, and, and this work has been pulled uh, from a meta-analysis that Murray Hartman uh, completed with Alberta Agriculture. Uh, and, and what it was showing was that with that five to eight range, uh, you really, uh, I guess, minimize the potential for risk and you're able to reach around that 90 to 100% of your yield potential. 
when you get down to lower plant counts, so under four plants per square foot, uh, you still could reach your, your yield potential, but there's a huge variability there. So you could just as easily hit 90% as you could hit 30% of your yield target. So that, that five to eight plant uh, plants uniformly across the field really helps to, to minimize that risk and then help reach your yield potential. Thanks, Justine. Okay, a uh, question for Kelsey. Uh, just about the data that Mackenzie presented, uh, we have a, an attendee wondering if that data is available anywhere publicly. Can't hear Kelsey. Kelsey, you're muted. I'll and, try. Yeah, there you go. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I we currently have the data under a password just so we kind of know who's going in and looking at it. Um, but I'll send my email in the question and answer and you can shoot me an email and I can get that to you. We're working at developing a page on our new uh, new website to host all this, but unfortunately it's just not quite live yet. Okay, good, thanks Kelsey. So there's a follow-up question now for Justine. Um, just done when to do plant counts. The question is, do you do it uh, in the spring or summer, early summer after emergence, or do you do it post harvest or both? Um, so yeah, there's several ways of doing that. Uh, we recommend uh, first thing in the spring once the, the crop has emerged, so you know what you're working with. Uh, that particular timing, you're also able to uh, calculate your um, survivability, you know, what had actually come up and out of the ground. We do recommend also following up with a fall field sample as well to see how many plants you lost throughout the growing season. Um, that way you can then look to, um, to see if you lost plants for the season from maybe it was a disease issue or in insect impacts. Um, that way you can see what happened throughout the season and then look at those potential yield rubbers and, and find a way to um, help reduce them in future years. So both the spring and fall plant counts are very beneficial. Okay, good. Thanks, Justine. So we're going to move on to the panel. Don't leave yet. We're going to move on to the panel shortly. Um, but I'm going to ask one more question to each of you. Um, so Kelsey, with regard to the 4R goals, the 2025 goals, can you just um, reiterate what some of the challenges are in getting there? Since this is a discovery forum, what do we need to, to discover to help uh, achieve the goals? Yeah, so according like with the fertilizer use survey, we've looked at a lot of data and often again, we highlight the soil sampling as being and kind of determining that right rate for getting to be a 4R and being the basic 4Rs. Um, so I think that's one key thing that we can take away from the data from, 20, from 2019. And I think looking forward, considering including soil sampling in the in your um, uh, crop plan and also working potentially, we see Working with the potential for our designated agronomist in Western Canada is another opportunity that we, I think maybe also we need to get the word out more in advertising these designated agronomists, but look for them and have that discussion with your retailer as well to, for an opportunity there. Good, thanks, Kelsey. Um, if anyone reads Canola Digest, we have a good series uh, that the 4R program there has helped us with. Uh, so it's at canoladigest.ca. Okay, Justine, the last question to you um, is on verticillium. And uh, the, it's about the timing and method for scouting. And, and the big second part to that question is, do we know anything about the yield impact from verticillium? So um, where, when to scout, how to scout, and the yield, can you do that in a minute? I'll try to. Uh, so with verticillium, right, new disease, we're still trying to figure the ins and outs of it. Um, for scouting, we find it is easier to do later in the season. So after harvest, uh, the symptoms are a lot more obvious in the field. You can see the shredding of the stem and the microscrotia. Depending on the environmental conditions, however, uh, this particular season, we were able to see it uh, prior to harvest. So at that typical 60% seed color change when we're doing our uh, disease surveying. Um, in regards to yield loss, we don't currently know yet to hear what the impact in Canada will be. Uh, we've looked at European models and they do see significant losses on, on certain years. Um, the, the work right now is funded through the um, 
the, through the CARP program, so from the grower groups, and that project is at the University of Alberta. Uh, so it's only in year two or three. So we've got some preliminary work coming out of that. Uh, so we should have some better ideas of yield loss in the, in the upcoming season. Good, thanks, Justine. I think pretty much everything we know about verticillium so far is covered off uh, in, at the chapter at canolaencyclopedia.ca. And as these, these really important research projects start rolling in with, with their findings, we'll keep updating that section. Thanks, you two. All right, we're going to move on to the panel now. And uh, as part of the, so I'm moderating, but I'm going to let the, the four panelists introduce themselves. And I see we've got Adam, Dean, and then uh, Mario and Lyle will be popping up there right away. So let's let's just my screen has got Adam first. So Adam, we'll start with you. Just a quick intro. Yeah, you betcha. Uh, so my name is Adam Gurr, and I'm a, a producer and on-farm researcher near Brandon, Manitoba. And I farm with my wife Laura here and uh, the rest of the family. And uh, yeah, we're just a small grains farm. We grow wheat, canola, soybeans, and dry beans, and we have a a no-till control traffic farming system we use to manage those crops and uh, yeah they so one of the questions was level four our management or research and uh, we we've done a little bit of uh, four hour related research through our company AgriTruth uh, it's it's mainly been with regards to nitrogen use and uh, we've also done a little bit with regards to phosphorus so. good thanks Adam Dean I am Dean Nelson from Wetasquin, producer, um, Alberta, Tasman, Alberta, and I'm a producer. I do about 1,100 uh, acres, and uh, we do wheat, barley, canola, and rotate between oats or peas or flax uh, for my fourth crop rotation. Uh, probably been doing 4R for the last, uh, uh, probably the whole farming, my home farming career um, for the last 24 years. Um, but been registered for the last six in uh, in the program and that and doing that with uh, different different sectors as the different uh, companies have changed so with uh, right now i'm doing with uh, growing purpose with co-op yeah so. good thanks dean all right mario hello jay um, mario tanuga i'm a professor at the university of manitoba in the department of soil science um, I'll give you my title. It's pretty long, so we may, may take about half an hour or so. So the <laughs> Natural Sciences and Engineering Research <laughs> Council, Western Grains uh, uh, Research Foundation, and Fertilizer Canada Industrial Research Chair in mm -hmm. 4R Nutrient Stewardship. So as you can tell, a major thrust of our laboratory and research and outreach is in 4Rs, promoting 4Rs, agronomic and environmental benefits. Right on. Thanks, Mario. So we can we just say NSERC, uh, or we'll just call you the 4R chair? Yeah, but sometimes <laughs> it feels like a stool. <laughs> right on. Okay, Lyle, you're next. Hi there. Yeah, I'm Lyle Cowell. I work as an agronomist with North uh, with Nutrient up in Northeast Saskatchewan. I've uh, been in this role for a lot of years. My background is primarily in uh, soil fertility uh, management with the farmers in this region and uh, been quite involved with the 4R program on, on a number of different platforms and projects over the past number of years. And uh, uh, I guess when it comes to 4Rs, I, I always think that uh, the practice of it uh, is and the education towards it and understanding of it is probably the number one the number one focus that we should have. Good. Well, let's let's get into it. Um, this is a live panel, um, so if you have questions, please um, enter them into the uh, the Q and A at the bottom, and uh, I'll, I'll get your questions as they come in. Um, but I'm going to start uh, with one of my own. And so let's just talk about um, what you think is the most important for our practice or practices for canola farmers in Canada. Um, if you want to take it a little differently, uh, what do you think are the most important first steps as a farm moves toward a for our mindset? And Lyle, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Um, what, in your experience with, with for our, what, what are the most important practices do you think for canola in Western Canada? I, I guess 
the right answer is to say all the four R's is important, but uh, probably in the, in a big picture for Western Canada, the first thing should probably be uh, sorting out the appropriate rate of fertilizer for the particular soil that you are farming. Uh, and so there is no right rate for every farm, for every region that we need to sort out the right rate for each field that recognizes that soil potential. I think that's probably in my mind, the most important in terms of practice. Um, I think the most farmers in Western Canada are doing the right thing. That's probably the most important practice is, is subsoil application of fertilizer. Banding of nitrogen is probably the number one thing that farmers do right in, in most of Western Canada. That'd be my, probably my top two thoughts. Okay, good. Thanks, Sal. Mario, let's go to you to, to follow up on that or take it in a, in a different direction. But this idea of subsoil placement, um, is that something that kind of comes to your mind as, as, as an important factor? Uh, more, more than important, I think it's absolutely critical. We are talking about a, a proven, proven approach to nutrient placement and we're you know we're talking here about nitrogen and phosphorus of course and i'm gonna up it up a little bit in that the the benefit of banding you know we have some uh you know there, there's a, a bit of uh, arguments about side banding or mid row banding let's just talk about banding in general so subsurface but then even take it up a notch and go to the banding where we're concentrating the nutrients um resulting in less interaction with the soil that allows more availability to the plant, gives us a bit of more time in terms of boosting availability, slows down nitrogen transformations naturally. So it's one of the placement is one of the, I, I wouldn't say, well, I keep saying simple. I realize it's not simple. It's based on equipment and it's based on field conditions and so forth like that. Um, but it is one of those things that a farmer has the ability to control with some planning in terms of equipment, um, the time of their operations. And so um, I, I do think uh, that placement, uh, yeah, I agree. I would, I, I, I have number one and two, just like Lyle did. Okay. Dean, I wanna, I wanna give you the second part of that question, which is about um, the mindset uh, as a farmer moves toward a, a four hour mindset. What, what got it going for you? Well, I guess, um... I'm like, I'm a fourth generation farmer. And so I wanted to make sure that it's good to be there. Uh, my dad passed it on to me with my grandfather and just make sure it's there for the future generations or whatever. Um, so that was part of the set uh, farm. I mean, the mindset of doing it, um, but it was just basic economics too. Uh, make sure that you get the right amount of fertilizer at times. Um, if you don't uh, have it, uh, if you don't know what your soil samples are, soil sampling is, I think is key. Um, that you know where you're going and you can figure out your rates. And so we've been doing variable uh, field rates for years um, and that, uh, which hasn't been that complicated. Um, logistically, I'm close to my fertilizer plant. So I'm only uh, like uh, five, I mean, five miles away from my plant. So it makes it easy to go get different blends for each field. But I was talking to them the other day and they have farmers that are an hour away and they can adjust the blends for farm specific, I mean, field specific, blends too for farms that are further away make one blend and just adjust your rates to make it work and so i think there's a that's important to uh, yeah. how you can do it and it's not that hard and difficult yeah having the supplier close by helps with some of those logistical challenges yeah. adam um just on the on the list let's get your thoughts on the placement part of it do you think that's in your mind as a as a farmer and researcher is that the a key part of 4r for you yeah, I think so. And I like that uh, Mario brought up the, uh, you know, talking about more than just nitrogen with regards to placement. Uh, I know there's been a move in our area and I think a lot of places in Western Canada to deal with logistics of fertilize, fertilizer applications in the spring. People are moving away from banning towards broadcast uh, applications. And I think, I know for myself, I would echo what Dean was saying on the economics part of it. Like, I, I really think... Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the economics of banding just makes sense. And so it's always been a no brainer for us, but I also think that's the same goes for phosphorus too. And especially if people are making larger phosphorus 
implications of these uh, phosphorus prices, I think it makes sense both from an economic and an environmental perspective to be banning it. Good. Thanks, Adam. All right, we've got questions coming in fast and furious here now, which is excellent. Uh, thanks to everybody for, for participating. All right, this one is going to Mario or Lyle. Maybe both of you could chime in. And it's a, it's a good question about soil testing, uh, which is a key part of the 4R message. Um, so the, the question is, uh, how do you respond to, to folks who may say, most of my plant available <coughs> nitrogen supply comes from post soil testing mineralization so the value of soil testing is overrated. What do you say to that? Mario, we'll start with you and then go to Lyle. Okay, so I think this, this is a, a, a key question, an issue that farmers have in terms of saying, you know, the testing either a fall or a spring is uh, not reliable in terms of what is actually released over the year. So um, I would suggest the following. How about doing a fall or a, sorry, a post-harvest test and do an audit of your system, of your field, and actually test and see, did you get a lot of mineralization that came out? You can, you can do some calculations in terms of what you added, what you started with in terms of inorganic in, and then find out what you're left with at the end. You could even do some um, envelope calculations. Um, it's, it's uh, the Plant Nutrition Institute has them, uh, provincial guides have them about nutrient uptake by crops. You can do a rough budget and say, hey, yeah, I did get nitrogen that seemed to appear. And then ask, Oh, this is what I think, it's, it's related with the residues from the previous year. What was the crop that was grown the previous year and the immobilization or the mineralization that was coming out of those residues? So to those farmers uh, that, that say the testing uh, doesn't do it for them, I would say, okay, well, do some testing after the crop and, and truly figure that out if, if there's an issue. Are you getting mineralization? And then if you do this um, a number of years, you may find the relationship with some certain crops ahead on stubble that are providing um, mineralization release the following season. Good, wow. Um, I, I guess sometimes I hear the word mineralization and we forget that there is also immobilization and, and that this is a balanced checkbook that in most fields, uh, the the release of nitrogen or, uh, from organic matter, but also the tie-up, I guess we call it, of nitrogen to organic matter is often pretty tight balance. So um, I, I still think a soil test is very valuable to determining the approximate levels of nitrogen in the soil. It's measuring the, the primary available nitrogen in our soil, nitrates. Um, we do need to remember that soil testing is a tool that to use in developing a good plan on your farm. It's not the the be all and end all as far as giving it the right answer for right rate, but it's an excellent tool. Um, I, and I always suggest to uh, people that, you know, so sampling really hasn't changed much. Analysis hasn't changed much in terms of nitrogen, but what tool we have been given in the past decade, especially is the, the ability to better target our sampling. So targeting, we do a better job instead of just taking a random sample across a field, we can now target between soils within the landscape and sort out, uh, we can sort out our nitrogen rates much more carefully and accurately than we could when I was when I was younger in my career. So that's that's the big thing that I think that farmers need to take advantage of right now. Good, thanks, Lyle. Uh, I have a question for, for Adam and Dean, it's coming to the producers, but just before I go there, do, do either of you two have a comment on the, the question from before, the one we just talked about? No? Okay, well, let's go on to the next one. So this is for, for you two guys. So uh, we'll start with you, Adam. What, ch what changes in fertilizer programs should take place, this is for, for the farm, to increase yield from 40 to 50 bushels per acre in the next five years as planned for the, for the Canola Council's strategic plan? Yeah, so we're at around 41 bushel per acre average yield across Western Canada. The goal is to get to 52. Uh, so notwithstanding what's going on on your own farm, how do we close that gap, Adam? Uh, I guess it depends. Uh, like, are they basing that question off of the survey data, like what producers are generally doing across Western Canada? Or? 
Hmm. Yeah. Well, it doesn't elaborate on that, but let's. Well, why don't you why don't you take it that way? So, what, what what's the fertilizer okay, yeah. program? Well, that, that, yeah. I I think uh, I'll speak to my local situation. I think in in a lot of producers are under fertilizing with regards to nitrogen, and also I feel that uh, uh, I know on our own farm anyway we haven't been meeting phosphorus removal rates. So I think there's an opportunity to increase average canola yields just by bringing that back into balance and, you know, making phosphorus applications to uh, soil test a little bit to a more optimal range for crop production. Not just nitrogen, but phosphorus as well. Yeah. Definitely potential there to average well, yields. Good. Well, so, yeah, so yield gains to be made by increasing nitrogen, but like you said, uh, really increasing that phosphorus to at least cover removal, crop removal. Yeah, like definitely uh, you can improve on nitrogen use efficiency by having balance of the P level as well. And that's what we've seen anyway with phosphorus applications is that you uh, increase yields of uh, nitrogen rate, you know, nitrogen rates. Good. Thanks, Adam. Dean, what do you think? Um, I think uh, one of the things also, too, is looking at uh, what the micronutrients are. Uh, I noticed in my fields over the last number of years, we've been bumping the boron um, because it's been getting low, and we haven't really watched that over the years prior to this. And so we've been watching that, trying to bump that up uh, so we can get a higher yield or whatever and help with the plant stand. Uh, and so that's, I think, it's, it's looking at those micronutrients, too. Um, we, the needle, it's so hard to move that because a lot of it, too, is environmental. Um, that, Backs each year, you can't adjust for that. And so that's, you know, you can do as much as you can with nutrients, but the environment has a big thing to do with it too. So. Yeah, good. Well, thanks, Dean. All right, um, there's a question here that that actually is just one of the questions I was hoping someone was going to ask. So this is perfect. Yeah. Um, but it's Mario. You had alluded to the to to the notion of four R being somewhat flexible. It's not a prescription, as in do this. Um, because of course every farm situation is different and, and there's not always a, a precise path. But, but this question is related to that. Um, when it comes to you know, broadcasting, uh, so if you're gonna broadcast, the 4R recommendation is to use a, some sort of inhibitor, but why don't we just say, don't broadcast? Why, why isn't the 4R recommendation to put this, the fertilizer in a band? Well, there are going to be times on particular soils that uh, you won't be able to subsurface band. So you, you can't even get a, 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 a tractor onto a field in terms of the rutting and so forth like that. So uh, Manitoba, we've had that in certain areas of the black soil zone. We've, we've had that for a uh, couple of years now in the fall. So it becomes very problematic. So that's why the four R's need to be uh, flexible and say, under these certain circumstances, this is the best approach. So, you know, I, I um, surface broadcasting has its place. It's not, I would say not the recommended approach, but it can be the recommended approach if um, there's no other options being able to, to get onto the field. So um, in our area, especially in the black zones, you can't count on the, um, the soils drying in the spring. If, you, if you're going in with very wet soils and you get a good snow pack. So I can see why farmers get really antsy. And so they want to get it on in, in, the, in the fall. So I can see that. And, and we don't want something that's going to handcuff farmers to uh, not have yield the, the following year. That nobody wants that. It's not that's not sustainable farming. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. Uh, do you want me to follow up on any other aspect of that? No, we'll, we'll move on to someone else, Mario. And, you know, this is, we're getting more questions coming in all the time and we, we're, we're a bit uh, confined for time, not just a bit, but um, so Warren, uh, my colleague there working in the background, just please, uh, if I start going long, jump in and cut us off. And I, I'm hoping maybe we could capture these questions that don't get answered. And uh, one of the things I do is canola watch and uh, perhaps we can, if, if the panelists are okay, we'll maybe put together five or so of the questions that didn't get answered and we can try to tackle them in another way, just because it's really important to, to address some of these questions. Anyway, to, so back to the flexibility. Um, Dean, let's, let's go to you. How important is it for the 4-hour program to be 
to be as flexible as possible for you? Well, um, just going back to the last question or whatever about broadcasting you know, or whatever, in the last two years, in 19, uh, 2009, I had to um, broadcast one field on because it was just so wet. Uh, we couldn't get in there to do it, so we had to broadcast it on. This year in 2020, I had to broadcast a field on um, my tractor front wheel assist broke, and so I had the co-op come out and broadcast my fertilizer and seed on, and I heavy harrowed it. Um, when And it was the worst looking crop everywhere uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, everybody's calling me and saying, oh, you're having problems here. I'll put some uh, silage in on that crop for you or whatever. Um, it, we only had two plants per square foot. Um, <laughs> And so that was it. And it was just looking awful. And it was about three weeks behind everything else. But by the end, we still got a 60 bushel crop. Those plants brushed out like just trees. And it was just amazing um, that how vigorous your canola is. <laughs> and, and, and I did everything wrong, but we did okay with it. But we shouldn't have. And so, uh, but you need that variability because things happen, equipment breaks. And so you got to go with plan B or C or D to get your fields in and get it done. And so you only have so much time to do it. So you need that variability. In there, so Adam, what do you think? Thanks, Dean. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Like uh, you definitely need some flexibility there with regards to, I think just more specifically with broadcast applications of nitrogen depending on the crop and uh, you know, how spring moves for you or whatever. And um, you know, whether you might want to top up in season or something like that. Right. Lyle, do you have a have a thought on that one? To some extent, I, I think we need some flexibility. Um, fertility is part of yield. We don't want to damage soil structure for the sake of applying fertilizer. <coughs> but, uh, nevertheless, I don't think that we should stretch the boundaries of what is called 4R too far. And uh, I, that honestly is a bit of a concern to mine, to me, that we, that we, if we're going to call something a best practice, then we need to identify that best practice. Some flexibility, again, to avoid damaging the soil if it's wet. Certain crops, obviously, broadcasting is going to work better for winter cereals or forages. Um, but nevertheless, we really need to be clear to the advantages of what the best practices are under normal circumstances. So that's interesting. So you would actually, uh, you would actually like to be a little bit more precise when it comes to the recommendations and, and would you go so far as to take broadcasting off the table? No, uh, I, I, I think this takes a step back to the focus needs to be on, on education, understanding what is the best practice. In the end, the farm belongs to the farmer and the practice has to be what works or, or what that decision is. Uh, the 4R is a, is a guideline and I think it's an excellent education program but it's not the law and we're not the for our police. And so I think the best practice or the best thing that we can office is to make sure that everybody understands what are the best practices and why they are the best practices. Good. Thanks. Lyle. So I'm trying to juggle a few things going on here. So, uh, so we've got some questions coming in, but I do want to, Maybe we can wrap up with this, and I'm not saying it's going to be quick, but um, like this is our canola discovery forum. So I really want to focus on some of the discovery uh, needs. And uh, so, what 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 research do we need? Um, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's just an extension need. Maybe we know everything uh, that we need to know, and it's just a matter of getting that message out. Um, but but as we move over the next five years with the, with like the canola yield goal, like was mentioned and the importance of the 4R adherence, Lyle, what do you think is missing? Well, we'll get everybody on this, but we'll start with you, Lyle. What is missing in terms of 4R research? Is that the... Yeah, exactly. So it, is there something that we're like you would, if you're talking to farmers, you say, man, I would really like you to do this but we just don't have enough evidence to to say that this is the right thing maybe that's what it is or maybe yeah. it's like maybe it's just farmers maybe it's just a it comes down to getting the message out to more and more farmers we know the right things to do but it's just getting that message out maybe, maybe it's a bit of both it, good news is that there has been excellent research across western canada and and probably the first thing that we should do is understand know what we know 
uh, don't be afraid to understand what research has been done over the past, not just the past couple of years, but the past decades, because we there has been uh, outstanding research completed over the over the past. Uh, well, really, that is still suitable to Western Canada since the 80s, certainly. Um, so we, first of all, we need to know what we know. Um, but also, uh, if I was asked what I think are some of the things that we need to learn better or understand better, um, first of all, I think there's some fundamental things. I'm not completely sure, and I know that there's a pro project on, on, on the undergoing right now to better understand our actual crop removal from fields of nutrients. Um, I think we need to refine what our removal rate of nutrients are. And I think we need to better understand that not just, not just as a, on, a, on a broader scale, uh, landscape scale, we need to understand our rate of removal and then in turn the best rates um, per, per soil landscape. We, we can take the next step to improve our accuracy on what is the right rate. And I think that that might be the most important thing that we drive forward. Yeah, okay. Well, the, the uh, I think it's Fran Wally, uh, somebody will correct me if That's I'm correct. wrong, yep. who's doing the, the updated uh, uptake and uh, removal table. So that'll be so great to have. Uh, Adam, let's go to you. And then Mary, I'm gonna end with this. We're gonna go to Adam, Dean, and then we'll end with the researcher. Mario on his thoughts, but Adam, what do you think? I don't know that I could really speak with uh, respect to the uh, for, or the research that's being done in Western Canada, but I know from a farmer perspective, uh, you know, really economics drives uh, system changes. And so if there's good data being produced, it's important to get it out there to producers to show them that and also include that economic part of it. Oil producers, yeah, you know, it's more efficient to do for our practice that because you're going to be more profitable. And uh, so, yeah, and if we don't have that data, then maybe you know, that's some sort of data that we generated to reinforce the economics associated with Because if they don't, if they're not convinced that it's going to make economic sense and the producer is going to shy away from it. Yes. And that's a big part of the program that you're doing with your research company, eh, Adam, is, is trying to, I mean, back to your point earlier about the nitrogen rate and, and the, the importance of phosphorus, and you're doing some good studies there on, on finding that right economic balance. Yeah, well, definitely. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, that's where I leave it. I guess just shedding a wall. So I think I've always taken the approach that 4R makes economic sense. So it's never really been an issue for myself. The adoption of these 4R practices, but I know that there seems to be a, probably a bit of a gap with respect to first in Western Canada or current research anyway, like showing important phosphorus surplus levels and the impact they can have on, on uh, crop yield. I mean, some of the stuff I looked at for that would be, you know, maybe done in the seventies with uh, flax and under low yielding environments or something like that. So I think uh, that, that would maybe help drive, uh, you know, uh, producer uh, uh, acceptance of uh, soil phosphorus levels and the importance it has on crop production. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so that's maybe. Good. Adam, your audio is in and out a little bit, but I think we got the gist of it. But, and uh, as Jeff oh. Shano calls uh, phosphorus uh, deficiency, the hidden hunger, it's not always easy to see what's happening when you're short of phosphorus, unless it's a, a disastrously short situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, uh, but, but yeah, to be able to, to show um, with real, real data, what, what's going on yield wise with, with lower phosphorus levels, that would be really helpful. D Dean, what do you think? Well, I think we got, I don't know what research says, Gadam says, what research needs to be done. But as a farmer, um, the biggest thing is uh, is the economics or whatever. It doesn't make sense. But things change so fast. I can't adjust sometimes to the changes that happen. Um, my equipment, I can't go out and just buy a new drill every other year because I just, I got to buy this other piece of equipment or I need to build a shop or I need to do this. And I don't have all the economic values to do the amount of changes that the research says. So to just, Go and say, oh yeah, I should do this now. It's kind of tough sometimes, so you have to juggle which way you want to go, which uh, how to economically choose which basket to put your eggs in, and so uh, so yeah. So it's kind of uh, I find that's the 
challenge as a farmer trying to take all the research and go, okay, I'm going to tech, put this one thing into practice this year or whatever, and then try it and see if it works. And then you could do step two, but you might have six that you have to do that you're recommending. Yeah. It's kind of hard to juggle those. So and that's, that's exactly what I think of when I think of the variable rate programs. I mean, it, I, I, everyone would, would figure, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If I'm going to get my best acres doing, churning out as much yield as possible, it all makes so much sense. It's just, if I, if you invest in a variable rate system and find out that, well, you know what, maybe it isn't the, the best use of dollars on my farm. Well, that, it's a big investment. So you want to make sure there is a return there. So I, I can totally see where you're coming from, Dean. All right. I, I really probably have to wrap up. I'm sure there's someone telling me that, that enough is enough, but Mary, what, what, what's missing or is it a, is it an extension issue? Is there some research that really needs to get done? Well, I'm a researcher, so I, uh, for sustainability of my job, I have to say there's research has to be done. Um, <laughs> uh, no, seriously, uh, it's the rate. It's, it's the rate thing. Let's go back to this rate. So I was just recently doing some number crunching, and it, with canola, because of the the commodity price for canola, uh, it's really easy for a producer, for example, to to get two two bushels extra yield to pay off for um, their enhanced efficiency fertilizer application and, and a bit more. Uh, and, but to, uh, to pay for the fertilizer uh, without an increased yield, they actually have to reduce their nitrogen addition rates quite dramatically, something like um, uh, 15% or so because of the premium cost. Well, a uh, farmer then, for example, if you're using enhanced efficiency fertilizers, you need to be banking on either reducing your uh, N applications or getting that yield boost. And I'm not sure we're getting that yield boost because our um, applications of fertilizer are usually uh, above optimum so that they're, we're not gonna shortchange any particular fields with, with nitrogen. So they're designed like that. So we did a study uh, sponsored by canola growers in the prairies through you guys uh, and, and gals. Uh, and that um, when we did not see an impact of um, basically for our practices until we shortchanged the nitrogen on the canola crop. So we applied 30% less than recommended. And then we started seeing some bushel separation with for our practices which tells at 100% recommendation, it was all flatlined. There was no effect. And it's, so if we're using 4Rs, and remember 4Rs is, is about what? Using nitrogen more efficiently. And that means getting into the crop and getting yield. If we're doing that, we need to think about our rates. Do our rates have to change? And I'd say, yes, they have to change. But what we're doing is we're keeping our rates similar to before, and then um, applying for our practices to that. And we're not thinking about the rate. So uh, my big recommendation is to farmers is to play with your rates, do some strip trials with the rate when you're going to enhance efficiency fertilizer, then ask yourself, where's my return on this practice? Is it either through the yield boost or is it because of my fertilizer input costs? Ask that, justify it, and then we're going to start really moving. I'm not seeing enough evaluation on, um, and maybe I'm wrong. Dean and Adam can correct me saying I'm, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but I don't yeah. see enough of that evaluation. Uh, I can't give that <coughs> to each individual farmer for each individual field. I can't do that. Um, so, okay. Uh, Warren, please jump in and tell me that I need to be done. But I, but Mario set it up so nicely that I feel like we can't. We ha we have to let Adam and Dean have the last word. So uh, just just on rates, um, do you do you increase your rate, or do you invest in uh, an enhanced efficiency product, or where 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 do you put your money? I know for ourselves, like I. You know, we've done some testing on enhanced efficiency fertilizers and we just haven't seen any value in our cropping system with those. Uh, and one thing I want to mention with regards to rate, I think is overlooked and maybe we don't understand is I feel like there's a long-term impact to high versus low rates of nitrogen. 
and that over the years you can, you know, so you could argue in the season of, yeah, I can reduce my nitrogen rate this year and you can show that I didn't see, you know, I hit optimum rate at say 120 pounds and putting more didn't, didn't do anything. Uh, but we have a we have a trial on our farm going back eight years now that's kind of showing the impact of those fertilizer choices over time, and we're seeing like kind of like a I feel like we have uh, more yield potential where we've been fertilizing higher, and so that might get missed on trials that are only conducted for a single season or, or a couple of seasons even where you're at rates. And so uh, anyway, that's just something to consider, I guess. Like. That's why I would tend to err on a on a higher fertilizer rate. Like we don't over fertilize. Like we're, I, like I feel like we make uh, good use of our uh, nitrogen fertilizer dollars, but we've just been able to show that potential long term impact of of nitrogen rates. So, so if you if you're looking at that uh, <laughs> nitrogen use curve, uh, your rate at yeah. the the top of the curve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is that if you if you if you were to test different rates in a in a cropping system. And you're only to do that test for a single season or a couple of seasons, you might miss out on potential long-term impact of different nitrogen fertilizer rates. It might not show up as being economic in the year of, right. because you're testing on a soil that's been well fertilized historically. But as you drop nitrogen fertilizer rates, I feel there can be a potential long-term impact that needs to be considered. Great. Thanks, Adam. All right, Dean, last word to you, and then we're, we're done. Thanks to the four of you. This has been a wonderful conversation. I feel like we could go on for a lot longer, but anyway, we're, we're wrapping up. De with the, De Dean. With the rates and that, it's, it's hard to do that on a practical level on the farm. Um, sometimes, um, like I know that, um, I'm just trying to think, oh, if I have this field and I have to do strip trials in it, then how do you combine so you get the same strip tiles in to figure out where that is? And yeah, you can put flags out or whatever. And sometimes it's, it's difficult sometimes to do some of those trials in a realistic farm area. Um, Sometimes it's easier than other. Um, it depends on what your equipment is, you know, um, and how that's set up to do that. Um, and so I, sometimes it's hard to do those trials where you're doing that long-term data and trying to figure that out. Um, and that, and then just logistics again, equipment. You know, can I put down? You know, uh, I was talking with my agronomist this week. Um, she wants me to put down 280 pounds of fertilizer on this one field, and I said. I only could put 250 in. That's all I could put in with the amount of weed I'm putting in. It's oh, just, yeah. that's a limitation. So it makes it hard. Sometimes we can recommend to do this stuff, but we can't on a practical side do it. And so we got to adjust it to make it work. Um, and so, okay. but it, I think there's good ways to try and do that. So. I've been told that time's up. So, um, but you can't, if people have more questions or want to talk with the four of you, there's an opportunity to do that at the lounge during the break. So thanks again, you four, and we're moving on. Bye everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See you thank later. you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Our next presenter is the Honourable Ted Menzies from the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops, who will be speaking on Responsible Grain Code of Practice. If you have questions for Ted throughout his presentation, please type them into the question and answer box on your screen. These questions will then be addressed during the next live question and answer session. The canola industry has invited Susie Miller and myself to uh, give a presentation and answer some questions after the presentation for the Canola Discovery Forum. So this is a good opportunity especially for those that aren't very familiar with uh, the development of this voluntary code of practice that we are calling responsible grain. And this started, uh, many of you would know where it started, from the public trust discussions that were held some time ago that was provided the background and showed the need for farmers to be proud of what they do and to share with their customers what they do and communicate and engage with their customers, which are the consumers. But we didn't have a tool for that engagement. So the CRSC decided that they should engage a number of individuals from their membership to put together a code of practice that would be workable for farmers 
that would strengthen the credibility of the industry and show how responsible farmers are in their sustainability practices. There's models that have been followed. The National Farm Animal Care Council went through this process as well as the round table, Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops. So we were looking for positive outcomes. So let me share some of where we have gone with this process, if we can. So why, there's the big question, why is the grains industry developing a code of practice? And as I said, we needed to build trust and to maintain confidence and to allow transparency for the consumers, whether that consumer is here in Canada or on a global scale. And we need to highlight that modern agriculture actually does help preserve the land and preserve the water and preserve the air around us. And farmers are good at this, but they need to be able to have a tool to demonstrate that sustainability. And just to be clear, this, this is not going to replace any existing standards, whether it be an environmental farm plan that you've done on your farm it will be complementary to that. And these programs can be used for specific crops, specific regions or specific markets, but it will be a baseline of how farmers grow crops responsibly. And it will help us communicate the beneficial management practices that farmers are using, continue to use, and uh, with the goal in mind of showing that we are continuously improving the methods of production on our farms. So the draft code was developed, as I say, under the leadership of the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops. Uh, the steering committee um, asked for uh, the bringing together of a group and it ended up as three groups three committees that would access the knowledge of agrologists and experts throughout the industry. But the underpinning was that we needed to show uh, how this aligned with farmers' financial sustainability and their viability, whether it's financial viability or their economic ability to continue farming. That is so incredibly important. So the practice must be reasonable and it must be under the control of the farmer. And it must recognize that modern grain farming is responsible and sustainable. And it must be using, we must be using the best available current science in all of the practices that we're using. And of course, it'll be national in scope, but this country is so diverse in its soils, in its climates, and in its crops. So it, uh, it was a challenge to be able to put together these protocols that are acceptable from Prince Edward Island all the way through to British Columbia. And it will cover all grain crops uh, grown as field crops and maintaining the voluntary approach that, uh, that we feel is so incredibly important to this for acceptance from farmers. So who is involved in the development of, of this? So you'll see the three different groups there, the three different committees. Um, we couldn't have accomplished this without the dedication and the contribution of all of the people that you see listed there, but also there's a lot of people in the background that aren't listed. I won't go through all of the names, but I would like to highlight the involvement of the Roundtable for Sustainable Crops Steering Committee. So the Roundtable is made up of 40 plus members. Uh, two of the strong members in it are the Canola Council and the, Cano the, Can the Canola Growers Association as well. And so they, there's a number of, member of the members that sit on the steering committee. As well, I have to uh, point out one individual, Curtis Rempel. We lean pretty heavily on 
Curtis uh, for his invaluable input. He chaired the scientific committee and he was our go-between from the scientific committee on to the development committee to make sure that we were that we were sound in our decision making. So Curtis's uh, Curtis's contribution, as well as others, uh, we had Greg Sekulich from the uh, scientific as well on the scientific committee, who's an agronomist, an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council. And you'll see also on the right hand side, our communications and engagement committee. Uh, we try not to let the scientists anywhere near a microphone, but we, uh, but we also uh, need to be able to communicate this. And so we thought that a communications committee was very important. So Caitlin Duncan, who's a, a Sasco Canola director was on that uh, communications and engagement committee as well as Kelly Green. So my role in this, um, let me sum it up. I, I guess I was shepherding a, uh, a very broad group uh, from all across the country. We had farmers, we had our input suppliers, we had exporters, we had food processors, and uh, we had Ducks Unlimited that uh, reminded us of the importance of water and wildlife in all of our deliberations. So we were broadly represented all across the sectors. So what is the actual responsible grain code of practice? As I say, I can't repeat enough, the code is voluntary, but for grain farmers who choose to follow the code, there are two types of practices. So if we look at this, there's, uh, if you add them up, there's actually 73 requirements through all of our modules and I'll share the modules with you in a moment here. Uh, think about these as core practices. And so these are on-farm baseline practices that grain producers would carry out. And some practices are regulated in, in some or all jurisdictions. And that's one of the challenges that we faced is from province to province, there's different regulations. And then and down to the municipal level, there's different regulations. So there can't be one template for all across the country. There's also what's industry imposed or contractual obligations for growing specific crops. So these will all follow, fall under the requirements. But there's also a necessity for recommended practices. If we're going to continue to improve, we have to use recommended practices and we have to look at those as enhancing our sustainability. So there's 89 of the recommended practices. But all of these practices must be practical, manageable, and consider the economic implications. So you're wondering uh, how, how we're going to, without this being filling out paperwork every night and no farm audits, how are we going to analyze whether or not this is effective? So if we go back to the Roundtable for Sustainable Crops. They've developed a sustainability metrics platform that will help demonstrate the sustainability measurements and they will be gathered on an aggregate measure. So over time, we'll be able to see that the voluntary process is effective and it will be working and it will be strengthening our, our uh, the way we message the, the way that people understand how modern farming is actually working. So I talked about the modules. So there's seven modules and uh, I don't need to list them off, but let me just give you a little bit of an example uh, for under nutrient management. This is by no means all, all of the required or recommended practices, but under nutrient management, we didn't want to reinvent a lot of things here. So a, a lot of it is referred to and, and under nutrient management, it would be the four R's. So stick with the right source, the right place, the right time and the right rate when you're apply, applying fertilizers. And this really reduces volatilization, it reduces leaching and it also protects the water. And you'll see this common theme throughout. All seven of these modules are connected 
So it took us some time to decide what was going to stay in each module because they're all interlinked in a different way. So pesticide, pest and pesticide management is uh, simply following integrated pest management. It, lower, it, create, it allows for lower volumes of crop protection products. It refers to clean farms and their recycling plastics. Soil management, reduced, or perhaps in some, in some places, many places, down to zero till. And it re reduces the use of fuel and erosion control. Water management, watch the riparian areas. Make sure we have buffer strips, appropriate drainage. And the clean seed under this, the seed and seed and selection of seed use. The underpinning one is use clean seed and use the best traits for your region. Land use and wildlife, respect biodiversity and preserve as much sensitive natural land as possible. These are, some of them are very plain and simple recommendations. The one that we added is health and safety. And this, uh, it took a lot of discussion to, to bring this to what are good recommendations um, and more so what, what are actually requirements. So the underpinning to that is we need to encourage the health and safety of all people on your farm. And that is under the overarching umbrella of all of this, that's being responsible. So those are our, our seven modules with a little bit of an explanation for each one. So what's next? Um, you'll see where, where we are, <coughs> excuse me, just in the uh, beginning of our consultation phase. And uh, we've, we've had one consultation up until now with many more planned. COVID slowed us down, there's no doubt about that, but uh, Susie Miller was able to keep us moving ahead. And uh, the important part of this, you'll see February, uh, from, from November to February will be our consultation phase. And we're, we'll be looking at a, uh, we actually have an, uh, an interactive um, process that we're going to communicate with people. We're going to listen, but we're going to learn from all the feedback. Uh, and there'll be opportunities for individuals to work on this platform, to provide us feedback of whether this will work on your farm or not. The implementation of it, once we've, uh, we've gone through the, the process of consultation, the implementation will be summer and fall, and then, uh, then developing, we're hoping for a rollout uh, ready for the spring of 2021. So it's a, an ambitious goal, but we think we're well on the way. So those are the questions, some of the questions. Do we have it right? Will this work on your farm? Uh, that will be the question that will be repeated over and over again, and it's critically important. So as I say, the consultations are being launched to build awareness and understanding of all of this and to obtain the feedback. Uh, we had some incredibly good help with, uh, with advisors developing this code, but that doesn't mean that it's going to work on every farm. So that's why we need to talk to farmers. We need to talk to industry at all levels, whether it's our input suppliers, the, uh, the green companies that are buying it, the exporters, those that are dealing with our international customers. So the consultation um, that, we that we have put forward will be very broad, very diverse. Um, and and uh, the, the questions that we will ask, will, we hope will elicit some good answers and those answers won't, or, or as I say, won't only be, be heard, but they will be listened to because it is so important that we get this right. So who is being consulted? Um, quite a broad, uh, broad cross section of the, of the industry from top to bottom. So right now uh, we have 200 plus individuals that, uh, that have, already signed up for the online workspace. As much as we had planned to do this in person, my feeling is that this interactive process that you as an individual can download onto your computer at home, individual farmers all across this country, and can go through it 
and review it and provide us feedback. If, if you see something that we've missed or if you see a way we can do it better, please provide us that. That's what will make this a good and valuable tool for us all. So here's the simple way to get involved. Um, sign up and make sure and see if your organization has, uh, has signed up and already provided feedback, but don't let that stop you. You can go as individuals, your friends that may be interested. We've had individual farmers already contact us and say, how do I take part in the consultation? Very simply go to responsiblegrain.ca and sign up. And uh, if you have any questions and feed us back your comments at info. Okay. And we wonder, some will ask where, what the impact uh, And I've given this some thought as to how this will impact the canola industry. And we think that it will continue to protect on a very strong reputation that we already have. Uh, i just quickly share one comment. I spent a lot of meetings with a member of the Agricultural Committee of, from China. And he and I were having lunch one day and he said to me, Ted, you know why we like Canadian food products so well? I didn't have an answer for him. And he said, because they're grown in pristine conditions. And I've never forgotten that. That's the reputation we had. That's the reputation we need to continue to uphold. And we feel that this will help it. And it will certainly help with canola. Uh, it'll maintain Canadians' confidence in our canola products that we're growing. And uh, it'll identify the changing practices that will improve the sustainability as well as the marketability. So this proactive approach that we're putting forward in this, um, we feel is very important because consumers are asking for it. More and more people want to know how their food is grown, uh, who, who grows it. And the more information that we can share with people, the factual information of how we are growing our crops sustainably, a uh, very, very important tool for us to have. So there's the, uh, the way to contact us. Um, we had actually had a few presentations before March out in public presentations. Uh, I had taken part in a couple of them, Susie as well. And uh, I was actually very, very pleased with the positive feedback from farm audiences. And uh, like, as I say, following our one presentation, I still feel that way. I think there's so many positives coming out of this but I can't thank the canola industry enough for your contributions to this. As I say, in all of our committees, through the steering committee, through the code development committee, the scientific and communications and the engagement committee, uh, your work has been incredibly important. So from input suppliers to farmers, to scientists, to markets, in consort with organizations dedicated to protecting natural habitat and its species. We feel that we've drafted a positive means for grain farmers throughout the entire value chain to show how sustainable their practices have become and that they will continue to improve with each crop. So thank you very much for your time. And Susie and I will be with you to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Next up, we have Tom Brosma from Plant Nutrition Canada to talk on some research ongoing outside of the Canadian borders. If you have questions for Tom, please type them into the question and answer box on your screen. We will then address these questions during the question and answer session following Tom's presentation. Greetings from Plant Nutrition Canada. My name is Tom Brosma. I thank Warren Ward and the organizers of Canola Week for the opportunity to join you. I've been providing science support for the nutrient stewardship programs of the fertilizer industry for the past 26 years. My goal is to provide an overview of global research relevant to your efforts in nutrient stewardship. 
This framework of outcome metrics identifies the major impacts of nutrient stewardship. The first three are most relevant on farm. They can be and should be part of the record keeping and decision cycle of any well-managed farm. Productivity is mostly yield, but can include quality and value as well. Soil health includes soil fertility. So nutrient use efficiency is often shown as the ratio of outputs to inputs, and it can also include more descriptive nutrient balances. These three complement each other. It's good to keep an eye on all three at the same time because you can really do well on one or two of these at the expense of one of the others. For example, you can imagine a situation of very high farmland productivity, high nutrient use efficiency, but continuously depleting from the soil and leading to low soil fertility over time. You want optimum levels of all three. And just by optimizing these three, we already have some fairly large effects on the next three, labeled four to six in red, the environmental impacts on water quality, air quality, and greenhouse gases. 4R does a lot to minimize losses in general, and it can also have a lot of impacts uh, very specifically on other losses like nitrous oxide, or dissolved phosphorus that have tremendous impacts in those areas. And it's our research, the research that we uh, support as an industry for the 4R Fund aims to link the impact of those practices on the total quantitative benefit we get in terms of improvement in those areas. When we get to the last three, seven through nine, We've got impacts in biodiversity, macroeconomic value, and food security that are more global in scope. The international industry is supporting a scientific panel on uh, responsible plant nutrition that is aiming to produce uh, new information on those topics, particularly biodiversity and food security uh, in the very near future. The North American fertilizer industry continues to support a 4R research fund. In Canada, a network of at least nine researchers has had support over the past seven years. Reports on projects in Canada and the USA can be found at the websites of Fertilizer Canada and 4R Research. Research supported by this fund emphasizes quantification, measuring the size of the effects of better combinations of source rate, time, and place. That provides a basis on which to communicate the benefit delivered by practice adoption. On right source, our research has supported uh, remarkable impacts on reductions in nitrous oxide emissions by more than 30%, urease inhibitors reducing ammonia loss in corn by 42 to 55%. Right rate combined with placement and timing reduced nitrous oxide emissions 42 to 57 percent and while increasing yields by three to four percent. Right time research shows that applying when runoff is unlikely reduces loss of dissolved phosphorus. Split application of nitrogen reduces nitrate leaching from potatoes. Right place, subsurface applications reduce uh, dissolved phosphorus loss by more than 50%. Incorporating urea reduced ammonia loss by 34%. Some of these findings apply broadly, others are more site specific. Our knowledge is not complete, but research continues. I'd like to look next at some of the trends in outcomes that we're currently able to monitor for soil fertility and nutrient use efficiency. The North American industry continues to support a survey of soil testing labs that was run by the International Plant Nutrition Institute. The 2020 survey is nearly complete. Here I show a distribution of soil test phosphorus levels across the prairie provinces. The soils are divided into three categories. The actual samples are analyzed using locally appropriate Kelowna or Olson extracts, but we convert to the Bray and Kurtz for a standard comparison. Two things are trending up the number of samples represented in the survey, and the soil test levels themselves. Since 2001, the number of samples included in the survey has grown from 77,000 to uh, over 124,000. 
the frequency of soils testing in the lowest of these three categories has decreased from 80% to 60%, still a large fraction of the soils. Generally, we can say that for our practices are avoiding depletion of soil fertility and slowly building up soil fertility, mostly where it's needed. The phosphorus balance is interesting to compare to the trends in soil test. The aggregated crop removals are shown here as orange bars. The background shaded areas represent inputs of fertilizer and manure. The recoverable manure is that applied to land. Non-recoverable is manure excreted but not applied. In several recent years, phosphorus removal in harvested crops exceeded inputs applied as fertilizer and manure. Over the whole period, outputs exceeded inputs by 7%. Crop removal is not being fully replenished, although it's close. The slight surplus in the last three years is not likely enough to explain the increase in soil test phosphorus levels seen in the soil test survey. As always, a balance over a broad area does lump together areas of surplus and deficit, and those surpluses and deficits could potentially be large. This figure breaks down the outputs into uh, by crop. The phosphorus removed each year by each of the major crops of the prairies. For the past 10 years, canola harvest removes more phosphorus than any other crop. Total removal has increased to almost 900,000 metric tons of P205 as crop yields and production have increased. Moving to the global scale, similar phosphorus balances compare Western Europe and the USA. Fertilizer use is plotted as the blue area stacked over the estimated input of phosphorus in applied manure in the brown. Superimposed in front of the input is the output in the form of crop removal, shown in 10-year intervals as green dots. In both Europe and the States, surplus began in 1930 and continued to the year 2000. Over more recent decades, fertilizer inputs declined more in Europe than in the USA. Crop removal plateaued there, but continues to increase in the USA. Has the higher level of regulation in Europe perhaps limited productivity growth? For Europe, the cumulative surplus amounts to 51 times crop removal. For the USA, a similar figure is 16. The uh, area in blue uh, over and above uh, crop removal expressed as a fraction of the annual crop removal today. A uh, similar figure for the USA is seen in uh, the province of Ontario, but the Canadian prairies are unique. If we look at uh, what we've seen over the past 50 years, there's actually been a slight deficit of phosphorus rather than a surplus. As a multiple of crop removal, Europe's cumulative phosphorus surplus exceeds that of the USA, but the Canadian prairies are unique in that they show a small deficit, no history of a cumulative phosphorus surplus. This is a very different situation than in much of the developed world. Turning now to nitrogen, this chart plots output, the total removed by crop harvest against inputs in the form of fertilizer, manure, and symbiotic fi fixation. The color of the dots changes over time from red in the 60s and 70s to blue more recently. And as product production has increased over time, nitrogen use efficiency has decreased, going from surplus to deficit. Expressed as partial nutrient balance, PNB, it reached 78% for the 2017 crop, though the trend line is at 70%. Output is still increasing. Nitrogen use efficiency is staying about the same for the past 20 years. The high efficiency further back represents nutrient mining, summer fallow, mineralizing the nitrogen that was stored in soil organic matter. 70% is higher than the world average and is close to the safe operating space of 70 to 90% defined by the European Expert Panel on Nitrogen. Here too, however, the average does obscure. The high efficiency of legumes like soybeans and alfalfa hides the fact that some other crops are maybe a little less efficient. Looking specifically at canola, industry data show improvement in both yields and nutrient use efficiencies in the, in the, the last 10 years. 
But there is room to improve the nitrogen use efficiency figure. It suggests that currently harvested nitrogen amounts to 59% of the fertilizer nitrogen applied to canola. Many strategies are being investigated through research as means to improve nutrient use efficiency and sustainability. Nitrogen producers are investing in blue and green ammonia produced with low or no carbon emission. New inhibitors of urease and nitrification are coming on the market. Expanding use of these um, inhibitors could dramatically reduce nitrous oxide emissions. Smart fertilizers using aptamers or nanoparticulate forms that hold the nutrient until the growing root of the target crop actually reaches them have been reported. Their efficacy across a range of crop and soil conditions is yet to be determined. The same is true for many microbes, biofertilizers, and biostimulants. Precision agriculture often involves a lot of technology if it's harnessed well to manage variability in both space and time, it has huge potential to improve efficiencies. We're seeing new fertilizers made from recycled sources come onto the market. And finally, integration of 4R with cover crops and conservation is essential if we are to reliably sequester carbon in soil. In order to drive the adoption of 4R strategies, 4R needs widespread recognition. The principles of 4R are embedded in the FAO Code of Conduct for the Sustainable Use and Management of Fertilizers. The Responsible Grain Code of Practice discussed by Ted Menzies also builds on 4R principles and training. Continued programs in Canada, the States, the, and internationally are aimed at raising the awareness of the value of 4R as an industry-driven approach to a more sustainable future. In conclusion, Canada's canola success depends on sound nutrient stewardship. While Canada's end use efficiency exceeds the world average, nitrogen remains a big part of our carbon footprint. 4R technologies can help lower emission of nitrous oxide, improved nitrogen use efficiency, and blue and green ammonia to reduce the carbon footprint of uh, fertilizer manufacture. Improving Canada's water quality depends on managing phosphorus and nitrogen sustainably. Placing in the soil, timing to avoid runoff are two of the four R components that can have very large effects. These are the aims of four R nutrient stewardship. A lot can be achieved by integrating the four R's for nutrients with sound practices for crop management and soil conservation. Thank you kindly for your attention. I look forward to your questions. On behalf of Plant Nutrition Canada, enjoy the rest of Can Canola Week. All right, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Ted. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for q and A. I've got, I've got a couple that came in. Tom, I wanna ask you one though. So I was looking at your phosphorus data and uh, that, so that you said the deficit of the phosphorus um, on the prairies, uh, it's about a, well, there's been no accumulation of supplies yet in Europe and the US, there have been quite considerable accumulations. So do you know, if I'm reading that properly, do you know why the prairies are so different? I can't uh, say for sure. And I would have to put a caveat there that I only uh, started the analysis at, uh, I think it was 1970 or so. I was presuming there was no surplus in the prairies prior to that. Um, I think the difference is the uh, Western Canada um, was built on grain production and a lot of that grain was shipped out of the prairies. We didn't have uh, the, the manure resource that um, Europe, North America in general, and Eastern Canada had. Uh, I think those, those would be the driving factors as to why there was no period of extensive surplus. But I, I, I think it just, it, 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 has, it says something about uh, the phosphorus chemistry uh, of the soils of the prairies. Okay. I was wondering if there was, uh, you mentioned manure and um, I mean, there's cattle production obviously uh, all across the prairies, but the, the, the intensive manure producing areas like um, cattle feed lots or, or chicken or hog barns, they tend, tend to be in more concentrated areas. So I'm wondering if th those, those phosphorus levels are averages. So we may have some fields in, in livestock intensive areas where the phosphorus is quite high, 
but through a lot of the prairies, the, the level is actually, the deficit is actually higher than what that those data might suggest. I think that you have a very good point there. Uh, the averages over a, a vast area can, can mislead quite a bit. Uh, indeed, um, there are areas where there's more, too much manure and areas uh, simply not getting enough phosphorus. So I think what would really improve that is technologies that make the uh, phosphorus in the manure more portable, uh, mm. make it into forms that are like fertilizer, blend with fertilizer and can be applied like fertilizer. Great idea. Okay, we've got one more for you, Tom, and then we'll move to Ted. Um, just a clarification or just a bit of detail on what is blue and green ammonia? What do you mean by that? Sorry, I probably didn't explain that very well at all, but it's a, it's a, those are buzzwords right now in the nitrogen fertilizer industry, partly because uh, one of the visions for the future, uh, if we have to move uh, as a society to a low carbon economy, uh, an alternative fuel is hydrogen and hydrogen uh, can be transported in the form of ammonia. So uh, there have been a, announcements by a number of nitrogen manufacturers of setting up piling, pilot plants using energy here and there um, uh, from renewable sources, either solar or wind power. And uh, those, uh, those sources are used then to, to uh, convert it to ammonia and the ammonia is produced instead of emitting uh, CO2 to the air, uh, there, there is no CO2 used in emitted in the production of those uh, fertilizers. It's zero for green and blue is simply a lower amount than, than typical. Okay. Thanks, Tom. All right, Ted, um, I got a long question here and I don't want to read the whole thing, but I think the gist of it is, um, uh, so if producers sign up, what are the implications of not being able to follow these modules to a T? Is there some flexibility in the, in the code of practice um, once they've signed up? Well, thanks, Jake, and, and a very good question. And this is the type of questions that we're, that we're expecting and that we're hoping to get from farmers. Uh, it's voluntary. And so there, as far as we can see, there's no negative implications to any farm operation or any integrated industry uh, business to that farm operation for not signing up. Um, it's, uh, it's a voluntary process. We think it will improve the overall, and, it, and it's a baseline. It's a baseline for agricultural production in the grains and oil seeds and special crops industry across this country. And so probably not everybody will sign up. Some people will look at the economic viability, the financial viability, and, and it was nice to hear uh, someone mention that that actually matters on my farm. Yeah. The, the financial viability of, of what you're, you're suggesting I should be doing. So not everybody's going to sign up. We hope there'll be a broad cross-section all the way across this country that will recognize the cumulative benefits to food production and the acceptance of our methods of food production all across this country to more and more farmers signing up. And it will take time. But, uh, but we th we're, we're, we're confident that, uh, that what we're putting forward, because we had farmers on this development committee, uh, I count myself as half a farmer, I'm retired, but uh, we had farmers from across Canada saying it, during the discussions, does this make sense? Does it not? And just to add to that, Jay, um, you before bet, you have another question, yep. yeah, I was just going to say that uh, since um, since the practices are based on uh, on science, and this is the, the best information we have at the time, um, it's just kind of the reduced benefit that people might see um, environmentally or economically if they're not, um, you know, working or following those right to a T. So that's, uh, that's kind of the main uh, downside, I guess. Then, and the, the person who asked that question came up with a follow-up just about about penalties. Um, are, are, have you discussed that yet, Ted? Is is there is there anything uh, where where if a farmer doesn't follow? Again, you said it's voluntary, so maybe maybe that answers it. But um, <laughs> are, yeah, are there penalties? Have you discussed penalties, or can a farmer who's signed up can a farmer opt out again once once he or she has signed up? Yeah, it's it's the practices that you follow. And, and let's go back to, to what voluntary means, is that, that I voluntarily 
offer my operations to, to follow the guidelines that the suggestions that are put in this, the, the requirements and the recommendations, uh, no one's going to have a, uh, a responsible grains police force going in onto your farm. That's not going to happen. It's voluntary. But the more farmers that adopt it, the more uh, of our exporters, the more of our food processors that recognize that we have this code of practice that, that, that provides an option for farmers to, to prove that they are operating responsibly, uh, the more I think you'll see farmers adopt to this. It's not onerous. It's, as I say, as I said in the video, it's not two hours of, uh, of homework at night. I remember my first Palm Pilot before most of you on the panel were born, uh, recording all of my data and then bringing it home to my 286 at two o'clock in the morning and plugging it in and backing up my data. That was a lot of work. But back in the, in the 1980s, I felt it was important. what the rate of fertility that I was using. That's back then. So when I was offered the opportunity to chair this, I jumped at it. And the, the, ultimate, uh, is, the ultimate goal here is, is, I don't know whether we want to use the word branding Canadian exports, but, but it's about market access uh, and developing markets more than premiums for farmers, or could there be both? That may follow. Uh, certainly that I think that's every farmer's hope that that may follow but that's not that's not the intention of, of developing this code of practice uh, it's just it's to be able to show our consumers that that we are acting responsibly we as farmers care about how we produce food we care about the people that that work on our farms and so that it's it's very important to to us to to be able to share that Okay, Ted, I got one more, just, just back to the consultation process and then we'll wrap up. Um, who, who can, and you probably said this, but uh, it went in one, one of my ears and out the other. Anyway, who's able to get involved in, in the consultations? Is that open to any farmer or is it, or right now are you just looking at the commodity organizations and, and the directors? Anybody that can type in responsiblegrain.ca and, and we welcome it because the more input we get to this from, from all regions, from all crop, uh, crop not crop condition, crop types, soil types. Um, the better, I think, is what he was thinking. Yeah, Ted, you, we, we missed you. Just a little bit of a break there, but you, so responsiblegrain.ca. And then is there a deadline on, on when a person can comment? We're hoping to wrap up consultations by the end of February. Okay. Good. Well, thanks to the three of you. Taryn, uh, any last thoughts from your perspective? Uh, no, I think uh, Ted summed it up best, just checking out uh, responsiblegrain.ca. Okay. And I'll be in the networking uh, section. Yeah. section. This, if anyone has any other questions. Yeah, so we're, we're going to the networking section uh, for, for the speaker virtual tables right away. Um, I'm just going to, there's a couple little housekeeping things and I'm just checking my phone to make sure I'm finding the right uh, stuff to say. Um, so details about the agenda and speakers for each of the sessions are at canolaweek2020.ca under schedule. Uh, please clarify if I didn't quite get that right. And um, just as we head into the networking session and then, then the lunch break, I would like to once again, thank our sponsors. Gold sponsors are Alberta Canola, BASF, Bayer, Cargill, Manitoba Canola Growers, and SAS Canola. Those were in alphabetical order. Uh, our silver sponsors, uh, Canadian Canola Growers Association, Global Institute for Food Security, and Western Grains Research Foundation. And the bronze sponsors are Canterra Seeds, DL Seeds, National Research Council of Canada, and New Seed. And a special thanks to AgWest Bio, and to the core funders of the Canola Council of Canada for their support. The next session starts at 1.30 CST. Um, it's 11.46 right now, uh, CST. And you can join that session two minutes prior to the start time. Uh, now, uh, I invite everyone to join our presenters and other attendees in the networking lounge, which can be found by going back to the main lobby page.
Thanks, everybody. It was a great morning. See you this afternoon.